it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, can't believe that so many people are here in presence, actually. It's been a while since I've been seeing so many people at once. Uh, let me start by thanking TNG for setting this up. I've, I've been told it's been on quite a short notice since, well, obviously, things are a little bit uncertain these days. So, yeah, great job, everybody, and uh, very happy to be here. My name is Johannes. I'm with uh, BMW. And uh, well, emerging technologies, what we do is to focus on technologies that are not quite ready for being you know, put into production, put into applications. And I guess the, the, the prime example for a technology that is not quite ready to, put, to be put in like productive applications is uh, quantum computing, right? So quantum computing is obviously a bit further out. And that brings me to the topic of today's talk. Why would BMW Group be interested in a technology that's so far out? So what I'm going to do today is to talk a little bit about you know, what we do within BMW to yeah, get to know the technology, what our efforts are. And uh, well, my goal is that by the end of the talk, in 45 minutes, you all be convinced that yeah, we do things right, right? That it is now the time to get started in this technology. And uh, yeah, um, so before we get started, let me start with a brief observation on the field. So I, I guess you all agree, quantum computing is a little bit hyped these days, right? Um, I think you all read articles in the news about, you know, entanglement, about um, Schrodinger's cat, about... I don't know, maybe even uh, teleportation about exponential speedups. And um, yeah, it, it shows that basically the field is massively overhyped these days. If, all right. Right, so it might be the bubble that I'm in, right? If you're an emerging tech, you know, your LinkedIn feed is basically all over the things that you're interested in. But yeah, I get bombarded with news articles on that topic. And um, yeah, everybody talks about quantum computing. So I'm not going to try to tell you that quantum computing and consciousness are both weird and therefore equivalent. But I'm also not going to pretend that I'm like, you know, owning the field. Like it's such a complex field. There's so many dimensions to it, right? It's like from computer science to quantum physics to electrical engineering. There are so many things that you have to master or put in different terms. There are so many people that have to collaborate in order you know, to come up with something of value. And um, this is what we try to do with MBMW. Let me start by basically you know, explaining the fundamental concepts. I've been told that actually in the last couple of big tech days, there were some world-renowned professors talking about you know, quantum computing, the fundamental kind of physics behind it. So I'll, I'm sure that you've heard that uh, either in prior talks or in the news, but let me give you a couple of you know, introductory uh, words on the topic. And let me start with the why, right? I, th I think the topic of quantum computing is such a beautiful fundamental research topic that probably even if there was no practical application whatsoever, it would definitely be worth investigating it. But um, there are a couple of trends that I'll try to describe that uh, do you know, uh, make it interesting also from a you know, business perspective. And the first one, and I'm sure you all agree on that one, is that we see, well, a continuously growing demand in compute power. Right? Let me give you a very practical example. I've been told that since 2012, the size of the largest AI model has been doubling every 3.4 months, right? And I don't think that this is going to, you know, decelerate anytime soon. AI is all over the place. How are you going to train those models? Because at the same time, and this is the second trend, you know, people say that the Moore's law that I'm sure all of you have heard about before as well is kind of coming to an end, right? We, we start to see some physical boundaries of what is possible. Um, there's only so many, you know, transistors that you can put on a microchip. So, yeah, I mean, the curve, the data doesn't really show a decrease yet. But, I mean, there are still physical boundaries with respect to size in the end of the day, right? And the third kind of observation is that still today, even with those huge 
high performance computing clusters that we have all over the world. Well, there's still problems that are fundamentally unsolvable. And this is, you know, not going to change anytime soon. Like problems are so complex and so huge that even, you know, in 20 years with the same increase in Moore's law that we observed over the last decades, we still wouldn't be able to solve those problems. And this is why people say, well, we need a change in the way we think about compute and we need a change of paradigm as to how we compute things. And this is exactly, well, or let me put it differently, quantum computing might be one option in, in a set of different options on how to change that compute paradigm that we live in. And this is now the classical, you know, Schrödinger Katz type of slide that I have to show in any quantum computing presentation. But um, yeah, let me just spend two minutes on the fundamental concepts, right? I think you all know that we live in a you know, binary world the way we do. Everything we do is always put into those zero one type of um, frameworks, right? Um, and this is basically the main difference to quantum computing, right? Where things are not either zero or one, but potentially everything in between. And the way I like to think about that coming from mathematics um, is that I always picture, you know, this distribution curve, this density curve that is kind of, you know, giving probabilities to different values between zero and one. And this kind of, you know, um, describes the way quantum bits behave. The interesting part, though, is as soon as you, you know, look at a quantum bit in detail, it collapses on one of the states and it will collapse on the state that will be, you know, more probable or like, well, uh, well, it's probability theory, right? Um, so qubits can assume several states at the same time, concept which is called superposition. Beautiful introduction, by the way, by Max earlier. Um, the second concept that I want to describe is the concept of entanglement, um, which is even weirder, right? Because basically what it means is that if you entangle two of these quantum bits, the moment that you measure one, the measurement of the other one will be deterministic, right? So we'll know what the measurement of the other qubit will do. And this is independent of where those qubits are located. And this is absurd, right? This is like, it goes against everything we believe in as rational thinking individuals, um, but it's a beautiful concept. And this is, by the way, where all of this teleportation stuff comes into play, right? Because basically there is no logical reason to explain that. And uh, this is also where this spooky action at a distance comes from that you might have heard about before. So what does that mean? If you combine these two concepts in the end, if you are in the digital world, you want to, you know, evaluate the combination of uh, two um, classical bits, you'll need four evaluations. However, in the quantum world, you just need one. Now, this is not that big of a deal, right? If you're in two uh, bit type of setup, but this scales, right? And you might already, you know, grasp the concept, it scales exponentially. And this is where the magic is. Now, exponential, you know, increases are hard to, you know, grasp, or at least for me. So let me give you a very, uh, yeah, unacademical, unscientific example as to what that could potentially mean. This is a slide I took from a course given in Stanford. Um, and yeah, so basically many of you um, might still know Commodore 64. And if you basically as, uh, assemble 10 qubits, you'll have the compute power of what a Commodore 64 is. So this is not the right um, analogy. You, you'll be able to represent a state space that has the same dimension that a Commodore 64 would be able to represent. Now, not very spectacular. However, if you triple the amount of qubits, you'll reach the compute power or the state space dimension of what you could basically, um, well, um, map with a AWS M4 instance. Well, talking to TNG folks, I'm, I'm sure that everybody knows um, Amazon M4 instances. Um, so decent amount of compute power, right? Now, if you double the amount of qubits once more, you'll have as much compute power as the entire global cloud. And this is insane, right? And now thinking about quantum computers in the long term, I mean, we're not there yet by any means, but we can go way beyond that eventually. 
Again, a very unacademical example. Right now, now as a mathematician, I'm supposed normally to talk about complexity classes, about exponential speed ups, right? But let me give you two very practical examples as to what that could mean. Don't look at these numbers in too, too much detail because, yeah, again, very unacademical. Take them with a grain of salt, but yeah, just to give you an illustration as to what that could mean. Take an example of machine learning, right? You want to compute the distance between two vectors, very, very big vectors. Now, standard Euclidean distance, doing that on a normal computer will take you a very, very long uh, amount of time. I mean, you can obviously parallelize that, and, but in the end, CPU is still going to be sequential. Quantum computing is very good at doing that, right? Um, and could do that very, very quickly. And the second example um, is probably the, 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 the well, best known example for, for you know, quantum computing speedups based on an algorithm suggested by Shor in the 90s. And it's on prime factorization. So if you have a very large number, and you want to find the prime numbers so that if you multiply those two prime numbers, they add up to this number. This is a very, very, very difficult task. And it's good that it's a difficult task because this is the fundamental basis of basically everything we do in terms of encryption these days. Now, quantum computers might be very, very efficient in doing that. And uh, yeah, this, I guess, is one of the reasons why quantum computing is so hyped these days because yeah, banks and also BMW and all sorts of companies are getting a little bit worried because basically data that you store today and encrypt today with encryption schemes that are based on this prime factorization, well, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, this data might still be valuable, right? Um, so definitely worth looking uh, a little bit deeper into the topic. Good. Now... Normally, when you explain a new technology, uh, it's why, how, what, right? But in quantum computing, I feel I have to add the but, right? Because we live in this dramatically overhyped time, right? And uh, it's very important to kind of, you know, put things into perspective a little bit. People say that there will be absolutely no advantage in the next 10 years. You see that on the map here a little bit. We live in this so-called uh, NISC area which means that qubits are still very noisy. They don't scale as much as you would like to. And there's very, very limited things you can do um, with those computers these days. Now, let me give you three examples of, uh, yeah, or like basically indicators that the technology is not as mature as you would like. The first one, and I think this is, yeah, it's quite interesting if you think about it. Today, there are, let's say, eight or even more different kind of technology paradigms that quantum computers are based on, right? Going from, you might have heard, superconducting qubits, ion traps, cold atoms, what have you. And yeah, scientists all over the world, like 50 different research institutions all over the world, focus on different types of paradigms to build a quantum computer, right? So, I mean, yeah. Nobody knows which of these paradigms is going to be the one to actually make it in the end, to be able to scale out, to be as robust as you would need. Which kind of shows you that, well, we are at a very, very early stage. And the second two challenges, um, yeah, are, are pretty well known, I think. The first one being that those quantum bins that I talked about, they're super unstable, right? Basically, you have to isolate them in... In, without any noise coming into play, in the moment that any noise hits them, they will collapse, they will lose their state. You won't be able to do these long algorithms that you would need. So yeah, there's a lot to be done basically in order to stabilize these qubits and to keep this coherence time. So the time where they're in superposition or even entangled as long as possible in order to you know, do manipulations on them. Yeah. So fundamental challenges still need to be overcome before the production use of quantum computing. And I can't emphasize that enough, especially in these days where Hannes Blatt writes an article about quantum computing every second day. Good. Now let's change gears a little bit and let's kind of transition to what we do with a BMW with respect to quantum computing, right? Like we've seen it's many years out. So how do you approach a field 
where you know that there is going to be no serious business impact in the years to come. We basically follow three main pillars uh, with our activities, and I'm going to try to you know, talk about all these three pillars in a, in a little bit. And I'll start with the most interesting one, I guess, namely you know, applications of quantum computing in the automotive domain. This is a slide my management loves, right? Because it basically says, oh, along the entire value chain, there are possible applications. It's going to change everything, really, right? Um, and it's true because, I mean, it's such a fundamental compute paradigm. Well, everywhere we have complex computation, which is pretty much all over the value chain, you have potential applications. Let me look into a couple of them uh, in, in more detail. Think about the way a, um, a vehicle is designed these days. Now, luckily, we have pretty good computers, right? So a lot of the simulation that is needed to ensure that a, that a vehicle adheres to the quality standards a vehicle has to adhere to is done using numerical simulations, right? However, unfortunately, the computers are not as large as we would like them to be. So whenever you do simulations, you have to focus on subcomponents, right? So you'll be able to simulate subcomponents of the vehicle and in, instead of crashing the vehicle a million times against the wall to see how it behaves, you can do a lot of that on the, uh, on, in a compute environment. However, since you only focus on subcomponents, whenever you do that, you'll have to add a safety margin to that simulation because you don't really know how the subcomponents interact with other components in the vehicle, right? Now, these safety margins, they will add up and up. And in the end, you'll, you'll probably end up with a design that is either too heavy or, yeah, maybe too expensive or like put into turn, like just not optimal, right? Now, obviously, the hope is that eventually you'll be able to do numerical simulations that are so performant that um, you would not, not only be able to simulate the entire vehicle, right? All subcomponents at the same time. So basically reducing all of the safety margins. But potentially, if we come to this like um, real time compute paradigm, that you might even be able to do that whilst designing the vehicle, you know, in CAD on your uh, environment. And at the, in the background, basically, the thing is simulated against all sorts of uh, safety um, standards. The second kind of big hope that, uh, that you know, industry has with respect to quantum computing is in, well, chemistry, really, right? I, I think you've probably seen the news, a couple of our competitors are working on that as well. The hope is that basically using quantum computing, you'll be able to simulate molecules on the suboptimal level and therefore, you know, come up with, well, new um, combinations of materials that are going to increase the, well, uh, durability, the energy density of um, batteries, and therefore, you know, obviously this could be a highly differentiating factor. I'm going to try to go into a little bit of mathematics next. Um, since I'm a mathematician, this is, this is what I do. Um, and I have two deep dives that we actively work upon in BMW. Um, and the first one is in robot path optimization. Let me take a step back and talk a little bit about the automotive industry first to motivate that example a little bit. Now, the design of a vehicle is a highly complex task, right? You have all sorts of different well, fields that need to come into play, right? From hardware to software from, you know, services to, I mean, we have 120,000 people working for the company these days. Additionally, we have to adhere to very, very high safety standards um, with respect to, you know, aerodynamics, with respect to, uh, well, there are a lot of metrics that you need to optimize. And um, this complexity that kind of comes into the play with these uh, different uh, standards that you have to adhere to, that complexity has to be managed, right? And the bad news is that for the last 20 years, this has not been going better for us. We have trends like uh, electrification, um, 
which leads to the fact that obviously you need more virus in the car, but especially things like um, a trend towards software-based architectures, which leads to the fact that you know, software stacks exceed hundreds of millions of lines of code. We see a trend towards globalization, right? The, the, the plants are being spread out all over the world. Research hubs are being spread all over the world. So generally, the industry is getting more and more complex. And all of these complexity has to be managed. How do you manage complexity? You have to plan, right? So you have to plan on all sorts of different uh, levels, uh, very strategic planning, tactical planning, and all of these different layers of planning has to kind of interact. And again, this raises complexity. So what I'm trying to say is that, again, you know, complexity leads to very complex optimization problems, a topic where quantum computing might basically play a role. And what I want to focus on now is a very small part, actually, of that planning processes that we have to engage in, in manufacturing. Luckily, a lot of our production is these days, um, well, handled by robots, right? So highly automized. Um, and basically, everywhere where you have robots doing the job, what you end up with is a problem where you have a set of nodes where you know, different things have to be applied. And you want to basically minimize the distance that is being kind of run through with these robots. And this happens, as you see here, you know, in painting, gluing, pretty much wherever. And I want to focus on a very specific example in sealing. And let me show you a quick video. This basically depicts a very specific you know, stage in our production cycle where robots apply PVC, which is some sort of plastic, on the vehicle seams. A seam is basically wherever two metal sheets kind of come together. And what you want to do is to make sure that, you know, corrosion, soundproofing, and a couple of other things are insured. And this is where, you know, these robots come into play. What you already see in this video is that there's four robots, I think, on this workstation. Uh, it's a pretty high dimensional picture, right? Like not every seam can be reached from every angle. And what you might also be able to see is that these robots could potentially uh, collide, right? So there are seams that can be reached by different robots. Interestingly, this is one of our um, production uh, stages that takes quite a lot of time. And if you've ever been into one of our plants, basically every minute a vehicle rolls out of the, of the plant, right? So basically having one production step that takes more than a minute is cost, costing a lot of money. So basically, if you could reduce that production step by just a couple of seconds, or just a second, actually, this would have a huge impact. Now, what does that have to do with quantum computing? Basically, there are two optimization tasks here at play. The first one is that you want to schedule the seams to the robots, right? So what robots takes over what seams. And the second optimization task is that you want to sequence the motion planning, right? So basically minimize the routes of the robots after they have been scheduled their specific seams. And the goal is obviously, well, you want to have the whole thing autom uh, well, automized so that nobody is basically working on that anymore. You want to increase the efficiency of your production facilities. And basically, whilst building a vehicle, you want to make sure that all of these seams can actually be uh, handled by, by robots, right? That there's no angle that can't be reached. Good. Now, let's do some complexity analysis. This seems to be a pretty standard, easy problem, right? Like, I mean, it has limited dimension. Uh, there's only four robots. However, if you think about it, um, with these different robots into play, you can put different nozzles on top of these robots because there might be different plastics that have to be applied. Uh, and the, the multiple amount of, of, of seams that actually have to be tackled and the different car models that actually have to be sealed, you end up with a huge solution space. And this number that is on the slide here um, obviously is meant to shock it's not quite accurate because with very, very basic heuristics, you can reduce that solution space dra dramatically, right? But nevertheless, we've been able to show that uh, the, the, the way these robots operate today uh, are still exceeding the lower bound of that optimization problem. The, there is room for improvement. And with the you know, current solvers that are based on 
yeah, heuristics, um, nearest neighbor type approaches. Um, well, there are apparently solutions that we can't um, find yet that are better. What we try to do is to formulate that problem as a cubo problem. So cubo is short for quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem. Why do we do that? Because it turns out that if you bring things into cubo form, it has uh, similarities to Ising models, and Ising models are known to perform quite well on quantum computers. I saw actually that last year or two years ago, you had a speaker from D-Wave, um, which is one of the companies that would be perfect for these type of problems. Um, and what you do to turn that problem into a cubo problem is basically binary formulation of the problem, right? So basically what you want to do is to have a... Um, to model the decision of whether I have to look at the indices C I uh, at time point T is sealed in the direction K. I'm sorry, there might be a little bit of a problem with that side, but um, so basically you have this binary problem, right? All of these things are encoded in zero and ones. And um, what you then do is that you end up with a graph, right? And what you want to do is to associate weights to each of the uh, nodes. So you have a weight matrix, you have a graph. What you then need is a cost function, right? Which in this very easy example is just um, basically adding up the distances that it would take for you to run through that graph. This is actually quite similar to traveling salesman problems, right? The textbook traveling salesman problem, I think is pretty well known. Just, you know, want to travel through all the nodes of a graph. It's a little bit different here because um, you don't need to basically uh, go through all of the cities in that graph, right? Only basically two cities per seam. And the other difference is um, that you're not allowed to basically, you know, seal the same seam twice. So there are a couple of constraints. And obviously, I, I told you that it's an unconstrained problem. So what do you do? Well, you just, you know, add your constraints to your cost function use some, you know, metric to put it on top. The two constraints here that you have is that each seam is exactly sealed once and that robots cannot, you know, be at two places at the same time. So, and for all times, a seam must be assigned to a robot. Adding these constraints up to our cost function, we end up with a cubo formulation. And now that's very good because now we can just throw it on top of our quantum annealers or quantum computers and uh, yeah, solve the problem, hopefully more efficiently than on classical computers. So what you end up doing is, okay, you have your model of the car, you want to draw your graphs, you want to compute the weight matrices, and you want to make sure that the, the robot is actually collision-free. The cube I showed you is actually only for one robot, so the problem actually has to be uh, uh, yeah, made more complex a little bit. And... Uh, and yeah, optimally, uh, you'll then have a, 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 an automated model generation that takes care of the job. Um, okay. So basically, three steps. You sample the, the workspace, you connect the adjacent nodes, and you optimize the cost function. Let me talk a little bit about the results that we ended up with, because, you know, this is all shiny and uh, looks beautiful. The harsh reality, though, is that on computers today, the problem size that we were able to model, well, I mean, I told you, I think we need 70 seams per robot, right? The, the problem size that we were able to model was five. Um, and actually, the performance of the, the, the model was horrible because it's, uh, well, I don't want to go into too many details. We tried it on all sorts of different machines, right? On, on, on digital needlers, um, so quantum-inspired type solutions, on D-Wave machines, which does this quantum needling stuff, and also on gate-based quantum computers, like the ones IBM and Google built. Unfortunately, you can build the most beautiful benchmarks, um, but it will uh, yeah, be slightly disillusioning in the sense that, yeah, there is still quite a long way to go. However, you know, the moment that these um, computers get more performance, we know what we can do. Um, let me go into another example. 
that is even further out. Okay, so I mean, this is a pretty basic problem, right? It's binary, it's well understood. Uh, I'm going to talk about one other example in the domain of quantum machine learning, where actually, funny enough, there was no scientific result that actually proves speed up, right? So, I mean, there's a huge uh, research industry behind quantum machine these days, but nobody was able to show um, theoretical potentials in terms of speed up. Nevertheless, machine learning is obviously a big deal, and let me show you why. Can we turn on the sound, maybe? Can I get a, does it work potentially or not? No signal? Bob. I mean, it's a pretty boring video without the amazing emotional sound that BMW gives to these videos normally. Um, the story basically is that AI is all over the place within BMW, um, and I'm not the one who normally speaks on these videos, but um, I guess it's a pretty fair assessment that, uh, yeah, I mean, it can completely change the way we interact with our customers, and it's, you know, amazing along our entire value chain, and there are a million of possible different applications. The one number that uh, I think you will see in the subtitles at some point that I want to take reference to is that we have a, a portfolio of about 500 um, AI applications within BMW. Um, we even have some internal kind of you know, business impact numbers behind that. And what I'm trying to show actually with that video is that AI is important. So you'll have to believe me, even though I'm not as emotional as the, as the formal speaker. So let, let's jump over this here and uh, walk straight into the mathematics, or unless anybody wanted to see the video without sound. But, um, so the example I'm going to talk about a little bit here is um, automated quality assessment. So this is a door panel here, and you might see uh, that there is a crack there. And this is obviously, as a premium company, not something we can accept. And we want to automate, uh, uh, detect these cracks in an automated way. And we do that actually with uh, standard AI, but it's a pretty well understood problem. We have good data. So we use that example to kind of, you know, try some quantum machine learning on top of that. Let me talk about quantum machine learning because uh, for, for me, this is um, yeah, such an exciting new field. A, a classical kind of quantum machine learning model uh, consists of two parts. First, the embedding part, right? You kind of have to bring your classical data into the quantum world, right? Which is called quantum embedding. So you have an embedding circuit that maps every classical data point to a quantum data point. And then you have the actual, you know, algorithm behind it, which basically is pretty similar to a classical neural network, right? Um, I mean, neural networks are parameterized somehow. You can actually also parameterize your quantum circuits. Um, and what you do is to basically take your input data, apply some rotation gates on the different qubits that are used to embed the, the data, and then you measure your circuit and measure the outcome, okay? Now, the first kind of set of parameters that you use to do this, um, to apply this quantum circuit are randomly chosen. And what you want to then do is by, you know, looking at the cost function, um, you know, change the parameters, so the rotations in that quantum circuit, uh, so that the cost function is basically optimized. And then you repeat that process until convergence, right? So pretty similar, actually, to... to uh, well, um, quanta, uh, to neural networks. Um, in a little bit more detail, yeah, classical uh, labeled data, embedding on a quantum circuit, then a variational classification circuit. And the, the big promise here, right? It wasn't shown, uh, like proven scientifically, but the big promise that is being made, a conjecture, if you will, is that using that high dimensional state space, Right? Uh, we showed that basically due to this exponential speed up with the increasing amount of qubits, your state space becomes huge. And that huge state space basically allows to find geometries 
in your quantum embedding of the classical data that you wouldn't see in the you know, classical world. And the hope is that, well, this will allow you to basically draw lines for classification in that, that huge hyperplane that you wouldn't be, uh, been able to draw in the, in the classical world. What are the takeaways here? I mean, we've got some first results, but I'm not going to bore you with those because they are, yeah, again, a little bit disillusional. Um, however, the cool news here is that it's a perfect example of how classical HPC infrastructure and quantum infrastructure can interact, right? So you have hybrid types of algorithms where the strength of both compute paradigms are being combined. And this is pretty analogous to the GPU, CPU type of world, right? Where you want to, you know, find the right compute paradigm for the job at hand. And I think this is exactly the right way to think about this problem, right? Because obviously, until we get this, you know, universal quantum computer that does everything, this is probably going to take uh, quite some time. But, you know, that, um, yeah, that hybrid nature of algorithms that might be, you know, very powerful. The other takeaway here is that, and this is actually a general assessment, the power of quantum computing lies in this, you know, high dimensionality of the state space, which might be a very interesting um, concept to think about. And the third example, and unfortunately I don't have a demo here with me today, but I don't know if you've ever gotten into contact with uh, how to code quantum, basically. Whoever basically built a, a neural network in some Jupyter notebook before, he's going to be able to pick that concept up in no time, right? So the, the libraries that you use are mostly Python-based. It's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's really no rocket science. Okay, let me shift gears here a little bit um, and explain what our general kind of approach to the topic is. Um, obviously, you know, we didn't show quantum advantage yet with the circuits that we use. There's been, you know, no business impact with any application that we do. However, um, we learned a lot, right? And uh, we tried to differentiate our problems into different uh, kind of, you know, domains. And what we try to do is to do fundamental research on the quantum system side of things. And at the same time, you know, focus on the application side of things and, and basically merge these two worlds together. Um, and yeah, this has been working quite, quite well. And we believe that the most important thing, though, is to do benchmarking basically in all layers of the stack. Because basically what you observe is in literature, the benchmarks that you'll find are mostly, uh, you know, very, very fundamental. You know, you'll be able to measure gate fidelity and, and basically metrics that we as industry are not very interested in. And our goal is really to formulate requirements towards research, towards all these quantum hardware manufacturers to be able to tackle the problems that are interesting to us. Okay, um, I have only a couple of minutes left. I was told to focus on the other two uh, topics that are actually also very, very interesting. So um, let me accelerate a little bit. Uh, what we observe basically is that we are with this very you know, research uh, close technology in a field where academy uh, like um, uh, research is always in the focus and the center of interactions, right? Any funded research project that we do is probably orchestrated by, you know, a professor rather than by industry. And where we want to go to, go to is a target picture where industry, academia are kind of on the same level and closely collaborate in an application-oriented uh, uh, way. And let me walk you through a couple of the activities that we've been taking in order to get there. First, we joined forces with 10 other companies, um, big DAX uh, uh, concern here in, 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 in Germany to, you know, basically, I mean, everybody has got small quantum teams, right? It's a very early technology. It's not differentiating. It's pre-competitive. So it's worth kind of combining all sorts of uh, uh, efforts. And our goal is really to, you know, strive for application-oriented research, right? Closely collaborate with all of the partners, but together. Um, yeah, if you haven't heard about QTech, I suggest you have a look if you're interested at the, at the white paper that we wrote, um, which depicts the concept quite nicely. And it's, it's fascinating, right? To be able to work closely with all of these different companies um, um, 
And it's rare to see that companies are so, you know, um, aligned with respect to the, the target goals. The second um, initiative we have is that we um, um, founded an endowed chair at the TU Munich. So there will be, uh, we're looking for a professor, or TUM is looking for a professor for quantum algorithms and applications that is going to be funded by TUM because we believe that bridging that gap between, you know, fundamental research and applications is going to be crucial and, and the right thing to do. And the third activity that is probably the most exciting is that we launched together with AWS a quantum computing challenge. So we basically open sourced four of our reference problems um, and invited basically the global community uh, to kind of you know, work on these, on these uh, research problems or actually applied research problems. Um, and these problems, yeah, I mean, check out the website or again, all along the different, uh, the, the value chain. We provided technical dossiers, we provided test data, we provided a mathematical formulation, and we hope to be able to, you know, start, kick off that market a little bit, right? Engage with all our different partners there and, uh, and have BMW be part of that ecosystem. All right, so I heard a beep, nevertheless. Um, I started the talk with the question of why is BMW Group interested in quantum computing? I hope that I was able to convey some of the motivation, right? Even though it's quite early. And there are basically three main drivers behind that motivation. I hope that I was able to convey that, you know, realizing potentials along our value chain is obviously the biggest motivator, right? Like the moment that technology hits, it's going to impact us all in a way we can't even comprehend today. But we also have a certain amount of social responsibility as BMW because we obviously want a strong Europe, a strong um, uh, Germany, and we want for a technology not only to be researched here, but also to be industrialized here. And it is now the time to do that, right? To basically pave the way towards that, um, that uh, movement. And the third dimension, uh, and it's something I didn't touch upon um, uh, today, but obviously in this new world, coming from our applications, there might you know, be potentials for all sorts of different uh, uh, business models. Um, yeah, but I mean, this is a little bit further out, but this technology opens an entire new world. So last two words, we are, as BMW, very much aware of the long-term nature of investments in quantum computing. We don't want to contribute to that, that hype even more, even though I'm today here talking about how great quantum computing is. Um, but we want to focus on these, you know, longer-term research collaborations, and we want to make sure that uh, the ecosystem is as open as it's possible, right? Which uh, seems to work quite nicely uh, when, when one looks at QTech. And we want to actively participate in research and be part of that emerging ecosystem to, you know, create that new market uh, here in, in Europe. And with that, uh, let me close. Um, and thank you very much for your attention, your presence here. And I'm looking forward to questions if there are any. Thank you.